Um, you've touched on the idea of neutrality or the creed of objectivity in journalism, and that's something that I want to make very clear. I have a bias, and I'm very honest about that bias. My bias is, first of all, um, the protection of international law. I don't think that is something that is ever examined by the majority of state-aligned media in the West and those in the Gulf states that are effectively working as a kind of outreach agent of Western media. Um, and I'm against war. Um, <laughs> I can't put it kind of any more simply than that. And in my opinion, our governments have been effectively waging perpetual war um, for decades, if not centuries. Uh, and their intention is to continue waging those perpetual wars because, of course, they benefit hugely from it. The uh, military-industrial complex benefits enormously from it. Um, and so, therefore, those are my two main bias. Um, I'm very proud of them, and I'm very happy to defend them um, with anyone. So that's just to kind of clarify exactly what my lack of neutrality is represented by. Um, and as I say, I think any journalist will have some form of bias. It just depends on their honesty and admitting that bias. And as Stephen pointed out, the majority of Western media and Western journalists are not very honest about their bias. So what I'm going to do today, let me just get this a little bit um, it's just examine, I mean, I'm going to go through a lot of material um, for you. Ken Stone and Hamilton kind of was a bit horrified by the amount of facts I sort of crammed into my presentation. Um, but I think they're important. I think they're important as a resource to really understand the corruption, the mendacity, and the, the sheer violation of international law that's going on within our own governments, within our own rogue states, criminal rogue states as I see them, that have been waging this war against Syria for nine years, and a war that was planned, of course, again, if you read Stephen's book, um, you get very much the historical context of this war and where it was actually planned long before 2011, when the externally fermented uprising actually started. So I'm going to focus on three elements of my investigations which I believe um, demonstrate particularly Canada's insidious role in supporting um, the soft power, the, the hybrid war complex um, consisting of think tanks, of so-called humanitarian NGOs, um, government policy institutions, all these incredibly powerful resources, many of them funded by the billionaire complex, of course, the, the globalist and capitalist complex that are often behind many of these NGOs that are serving government in manufacturing consent for perpetual war. The first one is an organization called Hollow Systems, which was established with Canadian governmental funding. Um, I'll go into greater depth in explaining about who they are, but basically they were established by former U.S. State Department officials, former uh, U.S. military, Navy, MIT experts, um, and so on. So not the kind of, um, as they describe themselves, the little startup agency that's providing ability for the white helmets to provide early warning systems uh, this is their marketing for civilians in Idlib in particular, to the northwest of Syria. Um, I'll look at the OPCW, the Organization for the Prevention of uh, Chemical Weapon Use. And of course, um, the White Helmets, twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, recipients of an Oscar in 2016, and nominated for another Oscar for another one of their promotional uh, movies in 2017. Contrary to their marketing material, where they claim that they are there to serve all humanity, um, they are effectively embedded exclusively with the terrorist and armed groups inside Syria. They do not work in the 85% of Syrian territory that is now back under the protection of the Syrian government. I will go further into um, the war crimes committed by uh, the White Helmets against the Syrian people 
Um, but this image for me was one of the first ones that I saw that for me completely discredited their claims of neutrality and of humanitarianism. Um, this was taken from a opposition group, or as they like to call themselves euphemistically, an armed group uh, video showing the white helmets removing the boots of the Syrian Arab army prisoners of war that had been killed, their bodies, um, then driving away with the bodies, standing on top of them and flicking the victory V. A later part of the same video shows another white helmet operative describing the throwing of those bodies onto the trash, like the Chabiha dogs that they are. So very early on, we started to see the behavior of the white helmets did not reflect the marketing or the massive PR industry that has supported them since their establishment in 2013. They were effectively, in my opinion, are established predominantly with the help of British intelligence. A former British military intelligence officer, James Le Mesurier, established them while he was working for a British Foreign Office consultancy group, ARC Group, in 2013. They were not established in Syria. Uh, they were established in Turkey and Jordan. This was basically a government funding document, um, which we discovered. Um, this shows basically the funding for Mayday Rescue. Mayday Rescue was established in 2014 by James and Missouri. So after he established the White Helmets, he then um, established Mayday Rescue to act as the implementing partner for the British government and to basically manage the White Helmets and to funnel the various donor funding to the White Helmets. And of course, the funding is coming from all of the belligerent governments that have a vested and declared, publicly declared interest in regime change inside Syria. So at this point, we can see between 2017 and 2020, Mayday Rescue were projected 9 million in funding. But what I want to focus on here, which was, again was a part of this document, is that Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, which if you do any research on this group, and I recommend looking at Professor Francis Boyle's summary of Amnesty International, he actually worked with them for some time before he dismissed them as an imperial tool of intervention. Um, and Human Rights Watch, which of course was established with financing of uh, one million by George Soros, also lobbied for funding from Saudi Arabia after that. So both of them have a reputation for producing the narratives that will enable any kind of NATO intervention. We saw it in Libya, we saw it in Afghanistan, we saw it in Iraq, and we've seen it in Syria throughout the nine-year conflict. But what is really interesting here is that both of them state, and this is in a government document, that the Syria Civil Defense, and I will cease calling them that from now on because there's an existing Syria Civil Defense that was established inside Syria in 1953, and it is the only recognized Syria Civil Defense by the International Civil Defense Organization in Geneva. That statement is on record, that they do not recognize any other civil defense organization operating inside Syria. So from now on, I will call them the White Helmets. Um, but they state basically that the White Helmets are their most routinely reliable source for reporting. So effectively what we have here are two hybrid war humanitarian non-non-governmental organizations providing the narratives that enable perpetual war in various areas of the globe, effectively relying on another um, Western sourced and Western funded and Western established inside Turkey, which is one of the greatest incubators of the terrorism that has invaded Syria for nine years, um, as their most reliable source. So here we have the start of the closed loop propaganda that has been used to criminalize and demonize the Syrian government. Wording in this document is very interesting. The White Helmets has provided essential corroboration that strikes, particularly Russian strikes of course, were not targeting ISIS or Daesh, but the, again, euphemistically called moderate opposition entities. Now the, the whole concept of the moderates has been virtually debunked, particularly 
with the invasion of the northeast by Turkey using what were previously moderate rebels infesting Idlib, but when they invaded the northeast where Western media had sort of camped under the protection of another US proxy, the SDF, suddenly those media were coming face to face with the head chopping, murdering, massacring, ethnic cleansing mercenaries that they previously called moderate rebels. So we've kind of seen a switch in Western media reporting because they've had to actually confront the groups that for nine years they've called moderate rebels. So what I'm pointing out here is they're providing essential corroboration. So in other words, in my opinion, they're providing essential corroboration for UK foreign policy. And in that case, for US coalition foreign policy, which we know is to demonize the Syrian government, the Syrian army and its allies. Now I'm going to try to sort of take you on a bit of my journey um, investigating the White Helmets in Syria because I think it's important to understand to what extent and to what lengths I went to um, to really investigate this organization on the ground in Syria. I was often accused of, well yeah, but you only go to the government held areas, you are escorted by the Syrian Arab army, um, how on earth can you be considered um, an objective source. Um, well, number one, every single media company that enters Syria legally and is escorted around a country that is at war by the Syrian army, this is perfectly normal. I don't think, I, I challenge any country that is war not to be in this situation. If a media company enters your country, they will receive the protection of the Syrian Arab army if they have entered legally and if they are traveling in government protected areas. <coughs> but in September of 2018, I kind of almost by accident um, entered a white helmet center that was still under control of the, in an area that was still under the control of the armed groups in Dara al Balad, uh, to the south of Damascus. And of course, Dara was the area from which um, to some extent, um, the revolution um, emanated. And during this time, the armed groups were still in negotiation, particularly with the Russian-led amnesty and reconciliation teams, but the Syria supported, so the Damascus, Damascus supported amnesty and reconciliation um, teams and negotiations. They had given up and relinquished their heavy weapons, but they were still able to keep their light weapons. So effectively, the area where I was working, we were escorted by the Shabab al-Sunnah, who were some of the militant groups that had led attacks against not only Syrian Arab army and military posts, but also, as we know, against civilians. Um, and effectively, this White Helmet Center was still operating in a complex, in a shared complex, um, with a former Nusra Front Center, uh, which was a converted school, and as you can see, the White Helmet Center was basically just across the kind of playground or uh, sports field area. Now, this was a common theme. In every area that had been liberated by the Syrian Arab army, having pre previously been occupied by the terrorist groups, mostly dominated by Nusra Front, very important point to make here, um, the time that I've spent in Syria, which is extensive, what I've really come to the conclusion is Al-Qaeda, ISIS, whatever label you want to give these armed groups, they are one and the same. The only real difference is where they may receive their funding, whether it's from Qatar, whether it's from Saudi Arabia, whether it's indirectly or directly from the US coalition themselves or from Turkey. But effectively, this is like a mafia operation. Um, they're linked by their extremist fanatic ideology. Um, they basically operate in areas collaborating with each other to an extent, unless it comes to competition over money, over status, over territory, and over power. But effectively, I would say that all these groups, and this includes ISIS, which of course kind of had its roots in Al-Qaeda, are pretty much one and the same. Um, they just splinter off into different mafia type groups. Um, and what we see all the time are the white helmet centers, either in the same building as Nusra Front or any one of the other extremist groups, 
or in the same complex, so in other words, collaborating together. When I actually entered the centre, um, what was, in hindsight, quite amusing at the time, it was, it was quite odd, um, I was introduced as an independent British journalist. Luckily, <clears throat> no one there recognised me. And in fact, what happened was they went immediately in a kind of PR exercise because the funding had been shut off by the British government six months earlier. So effectively, what they wanted to do was to sell themselves to me in order that I report back to the British government that they'd really like the funding tap turned back on. So that was just a little confirmation of the fact that this group perceives itself not as Syrian, actually, but they perceive themselves as an instrument of the British government and of the US coalition. Here you can actually see a British um, fire engine. Those came in uh, across the Jordan border along with, of course, many of the weapons that were supplied to the armed groups. I have two images that are relatively disturbing, um, just to warn you. I've pixelated them out. Um, but one of the investigations that I really wanted to do in connection with Dar al-Balad and the area to the south was a massacre um, in June 2017 of the Syrian Arab army soldiers that were defending the airbase. Their bodies were brought back. We traced the actual journey through studying opposition group, the terrorist group videos. We managed to actually pretty much trace the journey back to the White Helmet Center in Dar al Balad. And of course, the controversy at the time that the extremist groups were dismembering um, these bodies of Syrian Arab army soldiers, there was a white helmet operative clambering over the same bodies and participating in the parading of severed heads as a trophy um, and in the mockery of the bodies of the Syrian Arab army soldiers. And at this point, what I really want to make clear, because it's one of the kind of most, for me, one of the most criminal media narratives in the West, that the Syrian Arab army is some kind of Assad militia or government militia. The Syrian Arab army is the Syrian people. It's a conscript army. Every single family in Syria has a member of that family, or often more than one member, in the army. Every single family has lost a member of their family in the army. They are the, everybody's sons and uncles and brothers and sisters and aunts. They are not some, some sort of hideous entity that is fighting on behalf of President Assad. They are the Syrian people and they're defending the Syrian people. I have a series of interviews on my YouTube channel where I've gone and interviewed the families of martyrs. I highly recommend watching them because these are ordinary people who are proud of their sons and daughters defending their country and defending their right to live as in a secular state, not in an extremist state imposed upon them by foreign powers. One of the very important things that um, uh, Abu Mohammed uh, al Mahami told me, and he was the leader of the White Helmet Center. I had quite an extensive conversation with him, and that's all recorded in an article that I wrote shortly after this visit to the White Helmet Center. But what he admitted to me, I asked him, well, okay, but you know, you have a reputation of collaborating with Nusra Front, of effectively being Nusra Front. And he said, yeah, of course, they might be Nusra Front, and they might run a White Helmet Center. So this means that all the colleagues are also Nusra Front. In other words, if the leadership is Nusra Front, or if the leadership is Free Syrian Army, then all members of that group will be Nusra Front or Free Syrian Army, or any one of the other extremist groups. So the leadership determines the ideology of the group of White Helmets. But of course, what he said was, yeah, but not in my area. You know, he also told me that um, during the special evacuation by Israel of the White Helmets in the south, um, which of course was pretty much orchestrated by Canada and Owen Kotler, and I'll come on to that shortly, 
um, a number of ISIS uh, leaders and armed group militant leaders were also evacuated by Israel. The very fact that Israel is intervening to rescue the White Helmets, you know, Israel is not going to do anything for anyone that it perceives to be against the Zionist entity. It's not going to do that. So the fact that Israel was happy to intervene um, and to evacuate these White Helmets to Jordan um, is an indication of who is backing the White Helmets. And of course, it's been recently admitted by an IDF chief, chief um, that Israel has not only been providing um, medical aid for the armed groups inside Syria, but it's also been providing weapons. Um, I'll probably not play the whole video, but I'll play a little bit of it just to show you, because one of the arguments that I'm getting at the moment, particularly on social media, is, well, yeah, but, you know, the, the Free Syrian Army that we see now invading the northeast of Syria, it's not the same as it was in 2013. Um, because, of course, the argument is that the Free Syrian Army were the real moderates, but they couldn't really hold their own against um, the Syrian government, so they were reinforced by, you know, friendly rebels like Al-Qaeda, um, ISIS, and other truly awful um, criminal armed gangs. So let's just go back to 2013 and listen to Abdel Jabal al-Qaeda, who at that point was the Free Syrian Army colonel, talking about his relationship with ISIS. Well, there's also some individual mistakes made by the White Helmets, participating in executions, mopping up of extrajudiciary executions that have been enabled by Sharia courts run by terrorist groups, um, the detainment and imprisonment of civilians under their protection. Um, the list is endless. And I also have to say very strongly here that evidence against the White Helmets comes from the White Helmets. It comes from their own videos. It comes from their own social media. It comes from their own reports. It doesn't come from Russia or even from me. I simply pick up on what they're reporting and I disseminate it. Um, Russia gives a platform to people who are actually reporting the truth. That's the end of it. You know, Russia doesn't go out there and, and, and discover what the White Helmets are doing because the White Helmets make it perfectly obvious what they're doing. So do the armed groups who are working alongside the White Helmets, often filming them celebrating victories with the armed groups. So the archive of, of evidence against the White Helmets is ex extraordinarily big, and it's ever-expanding. Um, much of my time in the last few months has been spent in northern Hama, in, in fact, the Syrian Christian towns of Mahade and al Um Northern Hama has very recently been liberated from a variety of armed groups, again, dominated by Nusra Front or Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, as they've been rebranded in Idlib. This is Kalat al-Madik, which is Madik Citadel, which was around 500 meters from the restaurant where I'm sitting, where I took this photograph, in al -Skirbir. The building that you see was the Nusra Front uh, military headquarters in an old uh, grain silo area, and underground was the White Helmet Center. So again, we had the clear collaboration between Nusra Front and the White Helmets. And I have to say, I mean, I spent a lot of time in al -Skirbir, and I remember on one particular day from this very area, before liberation, we received around 16 rockets, one of which landed around 10 meters away from me. So I can testify to the fact that these were not moderate rebels. They were not targeting military installations. They were targeting children. They were targeting churches and hospitals. Everything that you hear in Western media about the Russian-Syrian campaign, for example, 
any liberation campaign, but particularly now in Idlib, you'll hear about the bombing of hospitals. But let me tell you, one, the majority of hospitals in the areas occupied by terrorists are taken over by the terrorists because they're the perfect building for them to set up their military headquarters, their Sharia court headquarters, and their prisons for the civilians that are not uh, complying with their ideology. So the signs for the White Helmet Centers were all over Kalat al madik which as I say was wholly occupied. The civilian majority of civilians had fled actually as refugees to al Skadir and to the surrounding areas. So now I'll take you into East Aleppo um, in December 2016 and then into early 2017 when I conducted really um, unpleasant inquiries amongst the rubble of the Nusra Front Centers and the former White Helmet Centers um, in East Aleppo. Now during this time what we found were a number of documents left behind. The, the White Helmets had tried to burn an awful lot of the documents and information that might, of course, uh, implicate them in connection to the British government, etc. But they didn't manage to destroy everything. We found, um, and that's what's important in this uh, element of the presentation, we found documents linking the British government to an organization called Adam Smith International and Integrity Global Consultancy. Now those two organizations had set up um, what they called a development program called Tamkeen. Tamkeen basically received financing from the British government, from the Conflict Stability and Security Fund that is also used to fund the White Helmets, um, through Adam Smith International and Integrity, um, then to Tamkeen, and then Tamkeen was giving that money to the local councils to develop effectively a shadow state in the areas um, occupied by the terrorist groups. Circled there you have Abdulaziz Maghribi. He was part of the invasion of East Aleppo in 2012. He was an armed member of the al Tawid Brigade that was backed by Turkey to effectively invade East Aleppo to also carry out some of the worst or most criminal industrial theft of a lot of the industrial centers in East Aleppo and to re-establish them inside Turkey. That has been mentioned in the UN by Dr. Bashar al Jafri. Maghribi then went on, um, he developed or went from Tawid Brigade to Abu Amara and Nusra Front. He was basically with both groups. Abu Amara, as I've been told in East Aleppo, actually offered, offered protection for Nusra Front. They were known to be one of the most brutal groups occupying that area. At the same time in 2013, and this is where it gets interesting, Abdulaziz Maghribi, so he's an armed group member of one of the most brutal groups in East Aleppo. He became president of the local council but he was also the establisher of the White Helmet Group in East Aleppo. So he was in receipt of the funds from the British government through Adam Smith International and Integrity to Tamkin to Abdulaziz Maghribi. So the British government is indirectly and directly financing known terrorist groups inside East Aleppo. And he was the head of the White Helmets, going back to what al Mahamid said to me, if the leader is al-Nusra, the group will be al-Nusra. I'm now going to slightly switch. I'm going to go to the Balkans. <laughs> and you might ask me why. Um, a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Marcus Papadopoulos, explains it, I think, very well. And I'll just read his quote to you. Yugoslavia and the Serbs were the first victims of the American-led unipolar world that emerged in 91. Because it was in Yugoslavia, namely Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Kosovo, where the US and its principal ally Britain, together with Germany, destroyed the sanctity of internationally recognized borders, disregarded the authority of the United Nations Security Council, and dealt irrevocable damage to the United Nations Charter by having undermined legitimate state authorities and having supported with arms, training, money, logistics, and intelligence information, armed secessionist movements, which comprised, of course, fascist Islamist Al-Qaeda and organized crime groups. 
facilitated the arrival of Mujahideen and jihadist fighters to the region and employed their respective media outlets to demonize the people standing in the way of their objectives, the Serbs, accusing them of mass murder and genocide and thus justifying the West's policy in the Balkans, and then directly intervened with military force to guarantee the accomplishment of their objectives. In short, Yugoslavia was the template for Iraq, Libya, and Syria. James Le Missourier, the former British military intelligence founder of the White Helmets, was in Kosovo in 1999. He was working in Pristina under none other than the direction of Bernard Kushner. At this time, uh, we know from sources within Serbia who were there at this time, that Le Missourier was working under Kushner, under the direction of Kushner, who was the UN representative in Pristina in 1999, to effectively remodel and transform the KLA, which at that time we know to have been um, comprising of Al-Qaeda elements and Albanian warlord elements, to transform them into the Kosovo Security Corps. In other words, to kind of whitewash them and to represent them as some kind of um, benefactor to the region. At the same time, the KLA was accused of cross-border organ trafficking operations, which were investigated um, by the war crimes prosecutor, Carla Del Ponte. Of course, she met huge resistance, even within the UN, to her investigation. But she did produce a book. Uh, and her reports at the time were of absolute horror that children, majority were served, were being kidnapped by the KLA and taken across the border into Albania, where they were being stripped of their organs. Why is this important? Because James Missourier, who was at least present while these operations were going on, and I've yet to find any condemnation from him that these operations were being conducted by the KLA while he was in the process of, of transforming them, at the same time, the White Helmets and I myself have taken many testimonies from civilians in the areas that were occupied by the White Helmets. They are being accused of organ trafficking by the Syrian civilians. So again, this is not some kind of Russian disinformation campaign. This evidence and this testimony is coming from Syrian civilians, but they're just kind of the wrong Syrian civilians. They're the ones that media in the West and governments in the West don't want to hear from. But Maxim Grigoriev, who is Russian, <laughs> he's from the foundation of the study of democracy, he's carried out a seminal investigation inside Syria, and I would recommend um, suspending your possible new Cold War philosophy that's been fed to you by Western media, and to read his report. It's available as a free PDF. Um, but what he went into, into some depth, as you can see in part four, is the organ harvesting, stealing of valuables from Syrian civilians, and theft within the organization itself. It is not a big logical stretch to understand that this organization could be involved in such heinous activity. The red market, as it's called, or the organ trafficking, human trafficking, child trafficking market, is a hugely lucrative harvest of war. As horrible as that is to say, it is the truth. And these kind of mafia activities which have been conducted by the armed groups in collaboration with the White Helmets are going on inside Syria. I was told by the head of forensics in Damascus um, that they are expecting, once Idlib is liberated, that there will be a huge amount of evidence of this activity will be unearthed because it's on the Idlib border, the Syrian border there, um, with Turkey that the majority of these operations are being conducted both on the border and inside Turkey. Um, I would just like to direct you to an article I've just written, um, which investigates the mysterious death of James Le Missourier in Istanbul um, on the 11th of November of this year. So what is Canada's role in this? Um, I pinpointed the three organizations, and I'm just going to go through them and pick out Canada's role in supporting these organizations. 
First of all, obviously, Christia Freeland on Twitter commending the White Helmets as courageous volunteers. They are not volunteers. Um, even the lowliest worker at the White Helmets receives $150 a month, evidenced by wage slips and documents that we found in all the White Helmet centers, three times the amount that a Syrian Arab army soldier receives for defending his country and putting his life down to defend his people. Um, Canada has supported, to our knowledge so far, um, the White Helmets, 4.5 million in 2016. I'm not aware of any funding since then, but I'm happy for someone to correct me. Um, of course, Canada, and you saw there Christia Freeland um, celebrating the evacuation by Israel of a number of White Helmets um, in July last year. And of course, that was very much orchestrated by Owen Kotler, who I'm sure you all know, um, who presents himself as a human rights lawyer, um, a renowned humanitarian. However, his very strong Zionist tendencies, um, his support of the responsibility to protect doctrine that of course has been used extensively um, by the globalist powers to manufacture again consent for their so-called humanitarian intervention against a country that they have decided should be destabilized and should be plundered for its resources. Um, he's also heavily connected to um, Alan Dershowitz, who's considered his twin in the United States. Now, of course, Dershowitz was known for his defense of Epstein in 2008 when he managed to reduce Epstein's sentence. Um, for paedophilia, basically. Dershowitz has argued for the reduction in the age of consent. He's also endorsed, effectively, state-sanctioned torture by saying that you know the state should be given the right to torture people, but only non-lethal torture, torture methods. Um, now, what's very important is what underpins all of these people's support and government support of the White Helmets is the fact that, okay, you know, they might have committed a few misdemeanors, like a few executions. They might have been seen with weapons. They might have been seen celebrating alongside Nusra Front. But hey, they saved 115,000 civilians inside Syria. I'm going to show you that no, they didn't. Um, that's my article basically going into greater depth about Erwin Kotler's role. And again, his support of the White Helmets. He's a clear uh, Zionist sympathizer, or I would say he's Zionist. He's very invested also, and that's interesting, in the Kurdistan project. He's a member of the um, Jewish Kurdish coalition supporting the separatist movement uh, in Iraq and also inside Syria. Um, Mike King is an author and a historian. He recently sent me uh, an archive that he created of an investigation into 4,354 tweets by the White Helmet um, operatives inside Syria in all the different areas. Now, you have to remember that you might say, okay, but that's just Twitter. But the White Helmets use, or rather their PR industry, use social media as their means of communicating information. So this is actually very important. Um, so the headline claim of over 115,000 lives saved, they have documented only 625 to the end of October 2019, of which only 88 are supported by plausible video evidence. But Mike did actually tell me you know, that I'm really pushing it to say that that is even plausible. Um, of which only nine are named, and only three have surnames. That's a long way off the 115,000 that we're told by every single government official when questioned about the White Helmets. What is also interesting, this organization is paid upwards of 200 million so far to document war crimes. Um, it's pretty much fiction. I mean, this organization has been created, yes, to document alleged war crimes of one demonized belligerent, effectively President Assad. They have not documented any of the crimes of the armed groups with whom they are embedded. So they're perfectly placed 
to see the torture, the rape, the imprisonment, the detainment, the deprivation, the theft, the summary execution of civilians, and yet not one of those incidents has been reported. The Al Ansari Center in East Aleppo was 200 meters from the square where the Palestinian child was beheaded. His head was sawn off by Nur al Denzinki terrorists in 2016. The White Helmet Center is walking distance. I've walked it. And they can see what is happening in the square. They did not go to, to prevent the execution, and they never documented that execution. So, where are the war crimes that they are documenting? They have condemned ISIS 18 times. Well, they're not actually really embedded with ISIS, so that's safe. Free Syrian Army three times, Nusra Front once, Al Qaeda zero, Hayat Tawiyah al Sham, which is effectively Al Qaeda zero, and Jayash al Islam. Jayash al Islam was responsible alongside Nusra Front for the massacre in Adra in 2013 when Alawite civilians were burned in bread furnaces. But the White Helmets didn't document that. They didn't document Tauba Jail, which I visited in Duma, where thousands of civilians were kept in isolation, where they were tortured on a regular basis, where they were used as lab rats for chemical weapons, according to their testimony, for drugs and for chemical weapons. And when we talk about freedom of information, let's have a look at how the British government, which is the primary funder of the White Helmets, let's look at how they monitor the transparency of the White Helmet reports. This was a response to a freedom of information request um, last year. Now I'm going to summarize it. The free, uh, sorry, the Foreign Office does not hold any information on the breakdown by province or area of those rescues. Remember, this is 115,000 rescues. There has to be some record somewhere. You cannot make this kind of claim without being able to back it up. Do you think the Red Cross or the Syrian Arab Red Crescent is going to be, or even the real Syria civil defense is going to make this kind of claim without records? I've seen the records from the real Syria civil defense. They exist name by name, by area, by surname, by father's name, by mother's name. They exist and they are on a fraction of the budget of the White Helmets. Foreign Office officials do not visit Syria to inspect documentation. They don't go to Syria. They don't carry out independent investigations into the White Helmet. It, effectively, what they do, they rely upon their implementing partner, Mayday Rescue, which is also funded by the British government, to provide them the analysis and the statistics to support the White Helmet narrative. They attend the annual general meetings held by the White Helmets and Mayday Rescue. So the British government, which is funding the White Helmets and is funding Mayday Rescue, attends an annual general meeting with both organizations that it's funding in order to receive the narrative that it will use to further enable its military intervention against Syria. Then I'm going to just very quickly give you a few examples of to what extent the White Helmets collaborate with and are embedded with the armed groups. First of all, this is a video, and I've just taken a very small clip from it, but the longer video is available, and it's available on the Sham News Network, which is a known armed group affiliated media network. So this is in Idlib 2015, and we see numerous White Helmets celebrating um, and calling for support for Jaish al-Fatha. Jaish al-Fatah is an alliance of terrorists and extremist groups, but it's probably made up of 90% Nusra Front, led by Sheikh Abdullah Mohaizani, a Riyadh-financed uh, and supported fanatic cleric. <laughs> And we also have to remember that Idlib, according to Brett McGurk um, from CENTCOM, is the largest Al-Qaeda haven since 9-11. Sheikh Abdullah Mohaizni, as I mentioned, there is actually, although I kind of hesitate to recommend him sometimes, uh, there's a very good article by Josh Hirlande about Mohaizni, which goes into a lot of depth about his activities inside Syria. Um, 
he trains child suicide bombers. He's, kind of, he's been responsible for some of the worst atrocities and ethnic cleansing programs committed against Syrian civilians and against the Syrian army, which is the same thing inside Syria. Um, in this video, if I can get it to play, we see the White Helmets being praised three times um, by Abdullah Mohaizani, as I've just mentioned, by Abu Jaba, the leader of Hayat Tahrir al Sham, or the former leader. Um, and if you think, okay, well that was in 2016, 2017, maybe the White Helmets have seen the error of their ways. In August 2019, uh, the leader of uh, Al-Qaeda in Idlib, Abu Muhammad al-Jurani, praises his partners in the White Helmets, and I want you to pay particular attention to what he says about the early warning system provided by the White Helmets. So effectively what he's saying is that the White Helmets are providing an early warning system of incoming airstrikes by Russia and Syria against terrorist installations, of course. So this is where I come on or come back to Hala Systems. Hala Systems is this early warning system which was developed uh, in collaboration between the White Helmets and, as I said before, former U.S. State Department officials, former U.S. military, former Navy, former intelligence, CIA-connected uh, officials, etc. Um, so, as I say, not some kind of small startup operation. And it was, of course, established, uh, first of all, inside Turkey. Funded by Canada, um, by the UK Foreign Office, by USA, CIA, outreach agent. So effectively what we have here is the Canadian government, among others, effectively providing an early warning system for terrorist groups, for Al-Qaeda, inside Syria. Established, I'm sorry, um, enabled by the White Helmets, also funded by the same governments. So, in my opinion, the White Helmets are a militarized intelligence PSYOP agency working for NATO member states to criminalize the Syrian government and allies and operating alongside terrorist groups also supported and financed by those same belligerent nations led by the UK and the US. So, finally, we come on to the recent reports from the Organization for the Prohibition of the Use of Chemical Weapons. Canada's involvement, Canada has been one of the primary sponsors of the OPCW and one of the most fervent supporters of allowing the OPCW a mandate to attribute blame, which of course would enormously serve um, their purposes inside Syria and in any other prey nation. They're proud to be a top donor to OPCW's work on Syria. Of course, when the Duma alleged chemical weapon attack um, happened, Christia Freeland immediately supported the Western narrative. The Syrian government is to blame for chemical weapons attack, even before the OPCW were able to enter Duma to carry out their investigation. Russia um, entered immediately, as did I, and a number of other um, media journalists, and we ascertained almost immediately that this was a staged attack. The majority of doctors and medical staff that I interviewed and I spoke to told me that the idea of a chemical attack was ridiculous. People were coming in suffering from inhalation of dust, which is perfectly normal in a liberation campaign when there are shells, um, when there are bombs landing. I mean, this is a war. Um, but the dust that was inhaled was the primary cause for them needing medical care. Those doctors, of course, were taken, um, including Hassan Diab, the young boy in the original White Helmet movie, supposedly depicting a chemical attack, who also went to The Hague to give evidence that he had not suffered from any chemical attack. Um, this interview that I did at the time 
with a young medic. I also have other interviews on my YouTube channel with both doctors, civilians, and medical staff. I'll go on just a little bit because um, we're running short of time if we want questions and answers. But basically this medic, and it was reinforced by all of the medical staff that I spoke to, um, he basically said as far as he was concerned the White Helmets were the terrorist groups. There was very little differentiation between them. They shared equipment, they shared financing, etc. And he was very clear about the fact that particularly one child was suffering with asthma and that was the main reason that he was having difficulty breathing. They gave him the Ventolin. He, he, he described the white helmets bursting into the room and, and then hosing people down. And he said the funny, kind of a funny thing was he said people that were coming in with symptoms of smoke inhalation just got up and ran out because they didn't want to get hosed down. Um, it was pretty cold at that time of year. So right from the beginning, those of us who you know, have always challenged the dominant narrative, for example, over the days before the Duma alleged attack, I had actually visited um, chemical weapon facilities controlled by the armed groups inside Eastern Ghouta with huge stores of chlorine, organophosphates, all kind of toxic materials that can be used to cause huge discomfort amongst civilians. They may not necessarily qualify as chemical weapons, but they can still do enormous damage if used in enclosed areas. And with me on those, on those uh, tours, with CNN's Frederick Pleitgen. Now, when Pleitgen reported on the Duma chemical attack, he somehow omitted what he'd been looking at that morning and the day before with me. And actually, when I challenged him quite politely about that on Twitter, he blocked me. <laughs> and has still blocked me. In fact, he put in an official complaint to the Syrian media ministry, um, which didn't go down very well. <laughs> um, so now we're going to come to the very important leaks that have basically established the corruption of the OPCW, the fact that it is entirely coerced as an instrument of power, and power being the US coalition and its allies that have been waging this war against Syria. Um, the first report that had been suppressed and the first whistleblower that came forward was an engineer called Ian Henderson, who um, provided evidence that the report that he had done into the extraordinary narrative that the Syrian helicopters had dropped cylinders from less than 1,000 um, feet, and they'd somehow managed to go through a roof, land on the floor, bounce onto the bed, and yet the bed was still intact, and all the ornaments on the shelves around the bed were still in place, and yet we're supposed to kind of believe that one. But effectively, the engineer's report completely discredited this entire narrative. But the report of this investigation was excluded from the published final report of the fact-finding mission. So this was the first indication that the OPCW was effectively suppressing and omitting reports which would demonstrate that the UK, US and France had acted unlawfully when they bombed Syria on the basis of a fraudulent chemical attack in March 2018. And here, of course, we have the image of the cylinder, which, as I said, miraculously bounced off the floor and back onto the bed, um, but didn't do any damage to the bed. Um, I also found this in a prior White Helmet promotional video, um, made in 2017 in Khan al which, of course, was the first area that was targeted by the terrorist chemical weapons against Syrian civilians and Syrian army. And of course, we know the history of that. It took six months for the UN to send inspectors in. And then lo and behold, the day they arrived in Damascus, 
we had the 2013 Ghouta chemical attack, which conveniently distracted from the fact that the terrorists had access to and were using chemical weapons against civilians. I myself was in Skelbia in March of this year, the Syrian Christian town in northern Hama, when more than 30 civilians, including children, were brought in from surrounding villages about 10 kilometers north, uh, northwest of Skelbia to Skelbia Hospital, suffering with inhalation of toxic substances. They had lesions to their skin. Um, they had respiratory problems. They had three children that were in really serious difficulty when they were brought into the hospital. Thankfully, they survived. So this was a chemical attack by Al-Qaeda against civilian villages um, in northern Hamar, and yet I can promise you that has never been reported or investigated by the OPCW. The next leak um, came very recently on the 23rd of November 2019 when Peter Hitchens, one of the few journalists actually in mainstream, um, had the courage to both meet with the leaker, with the whistleblower, um, and to view the email that this uh, whistleblower had actually sent to the OPCW in disgust that they were omitting vital information from their report. And information, I mean effectively what the OPCW did, because we have to remember that the UK, US and France bombed Syria prior to the OPCW report. So they bombed on an absolute, it wasn't even, I mean, you can't even say it was on a dodgy dossier, it was on a no dossier. So what the OPCW was clearly tasked to do was to provide retrospective justification for unlawful aggression by these three states and of course Israel against Syria. And in this latest leak, what it basically shows is that I've said that the OPCW left out key information they hid the fact that the so-called traces of chlorine, because the OPCW itself obviously decided it couldn't go as far as um, corroborating claims of sarin, but it did kind of intimate that maybe chlorine was used in its final report. But what this latest leak is saying is that those trace elements were parts per billion. I mean, you know, I myself saw the, the stores and stores and stores of EU-supplied water purifying tablets. That would be more than enough um, to produce the trace elements that they're talking about. So it contained major deviations from the original report submitted by impartial experts. So it morphed into something quite different. It morphed into something that its sponsors and donors would approve of. It suppressed a total mismatch between the symptoms so in other words, he's also concurring with the fact that the symptoms demonstrated or exhibited by the patients in the hospitals did not concur at all with any sort of chemical attack. We also have information more recently, of course, that uh, James Lemazurier, who I've already talked about, was meeting regularly with leaders of the OPCW in Turkey between 2015 and 2017. And the purpose of these meetings was amongst other things to provide witnesses to alleged chemical weapon attacks. So effectively, what you have is this process is Professor David Miller, who's a part of the Syria Working Group that has done seminal work in, in dis, uh, discrediting these chemical weapon attacks. Um, the witness selection or the process of witness selection was contaminated by an operative, James Lemazurier, paid by several of the belligerents in the conflict, most obviously the UK government, and of course, I'm sure by now, I don't need to point out to you, that the Missouri was tasked with sourcing witnesses from an organization, the White Helmets, that is sponsored and financed by the belligerent nations. Um, he himself is a former intelligence agent. Um, he is also paid, particularly by the British government, um, and he's providing information and witnesses to an organization that is clearly obeying its sponsors in the same belligerent nations. Um, we also, as I said, we have information that OPCW inspectors are being intimidated and they are being coerced by unidentified US officials into endorsing untrue reports. So clearly there is pressure being put upon the OPCW, and this is no new thing. Jose Bustana, the, the former head of the OPCW, 
was kicked out by John Bolton when fundamentally he didn't agree um, with the weapons of mass destruction theory in Iraq. We mentioned at the beginning the campaign to discredit dissenters that challenged the establishment narrative. This was um, one of the many reports that were published at this time when we were basically pushing back against the chemical weapon narrative. And of course, the collapse of this narrative now and with the um, exposure of the APC, OPCW as the corrupt organization it is, um, must raise questions over the other chemical weapon uh, narratives inside Syria, particularly Khan Shehun, where, of course, the evidence was collected by the White Helmets, it was transported, or the chain of, of um, transportation was basically the armed group, so predominantly Al-Qaeda. Um, and so therefore, <laughs> in my opinion, with what has happened with Duma, I must raise questions over the entire chemical weapon narrative that has been used to criminalize and to facilitate criminalize the Syrian government and to facilitate and um, um, manufacture consent for military adventurism inside Syria. Um, at this point, of course, they were describing my saying that the Duma attack was staged is to enter an Orwellian world. Well, in reality, the Orwellian world is being manufactured for us by the media, by the state-aligned media. And I just like to point out that they very... Um, cleverly um, cropped the image to use on the center page of the Sunday Times, and they erased or disappeared the rest of the US peace delegation that accompanied me to a meeting with President Assad in July 2016, as this is one of the smears that keeps sort of being regurgitated by the press in their attempts to shut me up. I just thought I'd like to point that one out. Questions that I think should be raised um, following the Duma chemical attack. First of all, if this attack was staged, as it clearly was, if children's bodies were rearranged um, in a way to make the whole narrative as appealing as possible to a Western audience, we need to be asking who killed the children and civilians that were used to produce those staged images. Where are the bodies of the victims that Riot Salah, the so-called chairman of the White Helmet, actually allegedly located for the OPCW, according to an article in The Telegraph. And last question, just to see if we're all paying attention. Why is the White Helmet operative wearing a gas mask, but no gloves, if effectively at this point they were claiming that sarin was being used? I'd like to just play a very short part of an interview with Scott Ritter, um, weapons inspector in Iraq, uh, urban search and rescue expert, an interview that he had with the Ron Paul Liberty Institute uh, shortly after the Khan Shehun chemical attack in 2017, which of course also elicited um, further aggression from President Trump. Right off the bat, we have samples taken by an interested party, in this case, uh, the rebels on the ground, in particular an NGO known as the White Helmets. Um, they, they, they took sampling without any protocol on the 4th of April. Uh, nine days later, they turned these samples over to the OPCW, and the OPCW accepts these as viable sampling. Right off the bat, any finding that is derived from these samples is, is illegitimate in the eyes of the inspection business. So why the OPCW goes, goes further and, and says, these samples show this, that's irrelevant. These samples aren't samples. They don't count the samples. They weren't taken by your team. Your team can't vouch for their, uh, for their veracity, therefore you shouldn't be talking about them. That's the heart of my, of, of, my, of my problem here, is that the OPCW violated every procedure it has in place that's supposed to guarantee its integrity as an organization, and in doing so, it's lost its integrity. And as you point out, the White Helmets are not an uninterested party. They're funded by the United States government and other Western governments in the millions of dollars, so even that would certainly raising the conflict of interest is this year, not? Well, not, 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 not just that. They, uh, they, they, they peacefully coexist with Al Nusra, which is now Al-Qaeda affiliate. You know, um, I just, I, that, that automatically disqualifies them. But even more so, uh, you know, I, I asked the OPCW to explain. They used the term chemical sampling unit. They're, they're supposedly a chemical sampling unit with the White Helmets. 
I look at the videos. They're wearing training suits. Uh, they're, 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 uh, well, no, no. Some of them actually wore. They, they, it's like they're playing Halloween dress up. They dressed up as if they were actual inspectors, came and said, but they're wearing training suits, which provide no protection. Um, they, it, it's a joke. What they did, everything they did, was theatrical. It was it was a visual designed to confuse uh, or send a false signal to an unknowing audience. But to right off the bat. When you Peter Hitchens made a very sort of chilling statement in his um, follow-up article um, to the OPCW leak. And the most important part for me um, is bodies like the OPCW cannot be trusted, then World War III could one day be started by a falsehood. We should all be familiar with falsehoods that have been taken us to war. Uh, I don't need to remind anyone of the weapons of mass destruction or the incubator babies or um, the Viagra fueled rape in Benghazi, women's rights in Afghanistan, etc., etc. And let's look at how much better those countries are since the West intervened for humanitarian reasons. Um, I would direct everyone to watch a film that I made in collaboration um, with a Syrian journalist, Rafiq Lutuf. Um, we go into huge depth about the propaganda from the very beginning of the war until now, until the White Helmets, basically. Um, I'll just give you a very, very short excerpt from that. <laughs> This is not the truth. You are reporting what somebody uh, told you. Uh, this, is, this shouldn't be done on CNN. And that this was a massacre that was carried out at the hands of government forces and Shabiha. Well, but both sides are saying that the other is responsible. So we have to ask ourselves how much of what you've been told about Syria is true? How much of it is a fabrication? If people decide to be free, independent, nobody can conquer them. Nobody can conquer them. And that goes for us in the West. If we decide to be free and independent, then nobody can conquer us. Nobody can take away our freedom of thought and our freedom of expression and our freedom of, of thought very important point to make and it's something that I've learned through working inside Syria and even outside Syria dealing with the attempts to shut down anybody who challenges an establishment narrative. <coughs> I don't need to mention Julian Assange at the moment. <laughs> so I think my final point here is um, we need an independent inquiry, we need a public inquiry into what is effectively a publicly funded organization, the White Helmets. An inquiry into the crimes that they have been accused of by the Syrian people. Why are the Syrian people being ignored if their children are being kidnapped, if their children are being returned with their organs missing, if their children are being trafficked? Don't they deserve a hearing? Don't they deserve that we campaign for a public inquiry into this group. We're paying for them. We're indirectly responsible for this. I'd like to know how many people who belong to this group, Canadians or uh, peace in the Middle East, are here. One? One. I'm disappointed because and it's not just that group. A lot of groups are fighting for one or two things in particular. How many are aware of what's going on in Bolivia right now? Mm. Thank God. <laughs> but how do we get more aware of it? That's the point. It's all tied in. And you know, I've followed you right since uh, you made some of your early things. And I'm a geologist, and I understand how rescues are made. And when I first saw that little kid being hauled out when he's buried up to here in rubble, mm. and rushed in and popped in a, a beautiful ambulance with the light set up to catch the orange chair, I knew what was on. But I tried to tell people this, I stood up in front of audiences, and when you mentioned that, even the raging grannies carry on sending money to those bastards who are over there. So you and Eva and others, I can mention a lot more, I know, I don't know how you do it. Carry on.
I think part of the problem is that um, anybody who's challenging that establishment narrative is usually pretty low on resources. <laughs> we're up against a giant. Um, we're effectively the David and Goliath, and we're fighting. You know, when I looked into the billionaire complex that is behind the BR industry of the White Helmets, and so therefore effectively the regime change war in Syria, it's unbelievable. It's like going into the kind of Alice in Wonderland bunny hole. It just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And what I found was that almost every one of these organizations and individuals, it all traced back to the Clinton Global Initiative. It all went back to the Clintons. And um, so we're up against a huge machine here. And um, yeah, sometimes it's, it's very sort of um, overwhelming to be up against this. But then I do, you know, I see people that come here and, and I receive reports from other people. And the most overwhelmingly good thing that I see is now the number of people that are coming to Syria to see for themselves. You know, we have Donald Lafleur here. Who, who went on his own time to actually see what was happening inside Syria. This is what we need. Because five minutes inside Syria, you can already see that, oh my God, you know, what we've been told for the last nine years is not true. So I think it's very, very important, one, to encourage people to go there and to make it possible for people to go there to really see the reality of what is going on. And that goes for every single country that is under attack, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's Chile, whether it's Bolivia. Um, it's very, very important for these kind of uh, delegations to be given access and to be able and, and to be enabled to report back. You know, Donald has gone through um, the most awful vilification process simply because he went to see for himself what was going on. So I think what's important is, one, people need to join an organization. They need to come together more. Um, many of us are acting individually, but we're so separated, we're so disconnected from each other, we're in different parts of the world, and I think what's important is to bring us all together, to create a cohesive group to fight against this. And I know that's very difficult, because many of, particularly uh, the left-wing groups have been co-opted, have been infiltrated, etc. But I think we all just have to keep fighting um, to express ourselves and to express our opinion. We've seen what happens if we don't. We've seen what is happening to Julian Assange. You know, we are all Julian Assange. And if we don't stand in our truth and in our integrity, uh, the future is really pretty Orwellian if we're talking Orwell. Uh, yes, well, thank you very much uh, for your very informative talk. I just would like to say that uh, for a long time now, I have been referring to uh, CBC and other news broadcasters as NATO news networks, because what they do is they provide the NATO line. And uh, so al along with the manufacturing consent, which you elaborated on so well, um, I, I would just like your impression of um, the support for the Syrian government in Syria, because I have heard a lot of things about many different political parties um, supporting the government and in this struggle, but we never hear about that. We, we It's always referred to as the Assad regime, but my understanding is that many different political parties and organizations within Syria support the government, and we never hear about that. I don't know if you could say a few words about that. Um, actually, uh, throughout my time in Syria, I've had the, the privilege and honor of speaking to many, many people who oppose the government, many people who are in opposition parties to the government. Um, but all of them will tell you, okay, you know, maybe we need improvements, we need reforms, we'd like to see this happen, we'd like to see this kind of development, but we're not going to kill our country to achieve it. So I'm talking about unarmed opposition the opposition that was not power multiplied by um, belligerent, hostile states. Um, and the majority, you know, when you're in Syria, I think what is remarkable is that this government, through nine years of just one of the most hideous military campaigns against them, 
an invasion by some of the most heinous armed operatives, mercenaries, extremist mercenaries. And, you know, I, I'm not going to go into descriptions of some of the atrocities that they've carried out, but they're unimaginable. And then on top of that, you have the economic terrorism, you have the economic sanctions, which collectively punish the Syrian people, the majority of whom support the Syrian government. And you have a government that can still supply electricity, it can still supply water, it can still supply internet, it can still supply food at subsidized prices for its civilians, it can still enable the development of hospitals and cancer centers. I challenge anyone to find a Western government that could sustain its state in the way that the Syrian government has through a nine-year war and nine years of economic sanctions that actually began in earnest before this war and a drought in 2009 that was very probably engineered by Turkey in order to tenderize the population and to turn them against its government before the West would intervene in 2011. I challenge any Western government to perform in the way that the Syrian government has. And you know, this is not, what I hate is this reductionist argument that it's all about President Assad. If Assad were to leave tomorrow, the Syrian people would keep defending their country. They would keep defending their secular existence against, as I said before, an Islamist extremist regime that would take them back to the Dark Ages, and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to take a modern, progressive, Middle Eastern state where its leader was a known reformist, speak to the former British ambassador to Syria, Peter Ford, he will tell you. Assad was a reformist. Everyone was optimistic when he came to power. The only reason that the courting of President Assad failed or, or, or started to turn the other way was after 2009 when he rejected the Qatari pipeline in favor of the Russian-backed Iranian pipeline. Prior to that, find me one criticism of President Assad. They don't exist. So that's the hypocrisy of the West. So in answer to your question, the Syrian people, those in the real free Syria, the Syria that is free of the terrorist occupation and plague, support the Syrian government because the Syrian government has given them stability. Even in terrorist held areas, they've continued paying the wages, they've continued supplying electricity and water. So this state, that's why I support this government. I support it because it stands in defense of international law against those that would violate international law and descend us into a, an abyss of global insecurity. And because it has defended its people, it has provided for its people throughout this war. Thank you. Thank you so very much for all of it. And I'm sure we can sit with you forever and it will never be ending. I just have, I have many questions for you, but one of them I'm going to make it very, very short. Um, do you feel safer here than you did on the ground in Syria? <laughs> no. <laughs> it is a very simple answer. Um, in all the time I've been in Syria and I've been in some very, very close to the frontline zones in East Aleppo, in uh, northern Hama. And I have to say, I have never felt unsafe. I have never felt insecure, not once. But if I come to Europe, or if I come here, or if I go anywhere where I'm basically in public challenging uh, the dominant narrative, I don't feel safe. I'm always alert. I'm always looking for possible attacks. I, my talks in the UK have been violently attacked. So I'm... As soon as I get back to Syria, I breathe a sigh of relief because there I feel safe. Thanks again. Uh, I have two questions. Um, <clears throat> first, where can I find that Vito movie? On my YouTube. Okay. And <laughs> second, um, so the mainstream media is layered, right? You've got your mm. CBC, your, your things that just sort of the sheep go to, yeah. and then you have other things like Democracy Now! and The Guardian, and like stuff <laughs> like that. So I'd like you to talk about the role that these other sort of almost like a catch-all or an umbrella to, uh, I would like you to talk about their role in this because I, I'm guilty of almost du being duped 
uh, better coverage. And you know, like uh, I was looking, at, I was listening to the CBC, and I was like, wow, what else is out there? And that, it, democracy now is one of those things that do almost do me. Um, but I, I'm happy to say that I got through that. <laughs> but um, if you could talk about that role. Um, yeah, very similar to Democracy Now, um, who, by the way, consistently refused to interview me, even when I was the only Western journalist on the ground in East Aleppo. Um, but they effectively just uh, fed me the, the government narrative and said that they didn't want me on, basically. Um, we also have The Guardian in the UK, which, of course, was established as the kind of left-leaning, liberal rag you know, providing an alternative view, but from around 2012, I think the last, maybe not the last, but one of the last articles written by Jonathan Steele, though, of course, was um, demonstrating that what the media in the West was not talking about was the popularity of President Assad. And there were also a number of polls in Doha, Qatar, etc., that I think Stephen covers in his book, demonstrating the, the extreme popularity of this leader, not only in Syria, but in the whole of the Middle East. Um, and so what we have, in my opinion, are these kind of, um, probably Stephen can describe this better than me as a, as a learned academic, but you, you have these kind of almost controlled opposition media outlets, Democracy Now!, The Guardian to some extent, some of the more um, counterpunch. I mean, they've done a complete... <laughs> kind of reverse from the early days when they were really recognized as one of the beacons um, in independent media. But they've now been infiltrated by the likes of Eric Dreitzer and the wonderful Louis Poirier. Um, and they are now basically turncoats to the independent narrative. You know, they're undermining it. The most recent article they put out was sort of saying, no, Duma was a chemical attack. You know, all these leaks have no validity whatsoever. So I think um, it's kind of, it's, it's a very difficult question for all of us to find a site that is utterly trustworthy. And I think what we all kind of have to do is to divorce from the need of, to rely upon any particular site and to develop our own way of independent thinking and rational um, analysis of any given situation. And I said to someone the other night, what we don't focus on enough is international law. Because if we use international law as a measure, that gives us a very good indication of which side of that line we should be on. I know that international law is largely corrupted now by the, by the US, the UK, and France, by the Security Council, etc., etc. But nevertheless, there are laws in place, and if we focus on that, that gives us a very good measure. Even if we don't like a particular government, if we, if we don't like certain measures of that government, if we come back to the international law line, that gives us a very clear indication of where we should be standing as anti-war activists. And I see it all the time. I mean, I see you know, everyone now cheering for the Hong Kong demonstrations, which are clearly um, NED financed and orchestrated, you know, while the Yellow Vest movement in France is being completely um, blacked out. Nobody's getting any information about Macron's state-sanctioned violence against his own people. So, um, yeah, there are channels like Democracy Now. Finian Cunningham has written a very good article, um, basically, I'll give you the details afterwards, um, debunking um, Democracy Now. Um, so, yeah, I think we just have to be very wary of the fact And Syria seemed to be some kind of watershed where media was effectively taken over by intelligence <laughs> agents. I would very clearly say that about The Guardian. I've written an article about Martin Chilov about the fact that I very, very clearly believe that he's part of MI6, just from his operations inside Syria, how he can mingle with ISIS fighters, how he can operate alongside Al-Qaeda without getting his head chopped off or without getting kidnapped, right? So I think, you know, I, I think we all have to get out of this paradigm of relying on any one source or any one um, outlet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go where this one uh, talk was being 
I just mentioned how to work with organizers. Um, it's important to point out that there has been a huge campaign. I think in partial answer to that question, which is you had a hard time to find the venue and find out where and when it is, it's important to point out that through this seven city tour that Vanessa is putting on, uh, there has been uh, a lot of cowardly reactions to emails being sent to institutions that caused deplatforming in various venues, and that happened here in Ottawa as well. Yeah, I sort of assumed that. Huh? Yes, and <laughs> it's been systematic. It's very unfortunate, especially universities should be standing up for freedom of expression and academic freedom, and they're the first to run from it and find any pretext to get out of uh, saying that it was okay to book a room, you know? So this has happened systematically, and that's one of the reasons that we've struggled and had to do things at the last minute. I have one one very short question. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's concerning the Iranian presence in Syria. And I was wondering, do you have sort of any sort of estimate or guess of how many Iranian troops are there fighting? Uh, I don't know if anybody here has any uh, good estimation. No, I don't. Um, what do you mean by experts? Yeah. You no, uh, yeah, exactly. What do you experts? Yeah. Um, of course, I mean, Iran, in my opinion, plays a very important role, for example, on the Iraqi border with Hashid al-Shabi, the new forces um, that are playing a very important role in securing Syria's borders um, with Iraq and, of course, Hezbollah um, in Lebanon also. And that's one of the reasons, I believe, that Lebanon and Iraq are now being destabilized. Um, but the Iranian influence is, is, yes, very much from a military expertise standpoint. Hezbollah are fighting on the ground in specific areas, um, but they, I think they've reduced their presence in Syria. Yeah. Um, so, no, I, I don't have any exact figures, but it's, it's a relatively small military deployment. short. It's just uh, before this group escapes, I wanted to make the point, be careful on the internet because I've had a lot of stuff that is cut off now and now I'm just contacted by their messenger to send things out uh, because I've never been trained in this sort of thing. But, but that's a minor thing to be aware of. A more important thing is keeping people together. This small group here, you know, hung on with Vanessa beyond the time. I just wanted to say another movie is, is Pilger. He's a tremendous guy who has thousands of things. And there are a couple of great ones that go back to the Dulles brothers. Read about that, okay? And then the other thing is, the other thing is that uh, to stay together, we should form a group that covers everything, of what you've talked about, instead of all working our own individual things. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we should probably so wrap up. Vanessa, do you want to close? We, okay, members of the community want to thank you. So we have that lined up. Do you want to make any final comments before you receive flowers and thanks? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I would just really like to thank the organizers. I know this has been an incredibly kind of difficult uh, tour to organize and to um, maintain. And thank you to everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. And I, 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 I Thank you, Ken, for doing that. Uh, I would also like to recognize uh, somebody who has also been at the forefront of, uh, of truth uh, in going to uh, places yeah. in Lebanon, in Palestine, and uh, standing up for, uh, for the young people there. That's the former member of parliament in Gatineau, know, uh, Mr. Richard Redo. Dini, 
Denis has done a remarkable job working uh, on a lot of stuff to make sure that uh, even when we lost the venue to, to secure another one, uh, to follow up on the conference calls and all the things that are happening in, uh, in Hamilton, in Mississauga, in Toronto, in Montreal, Winnipeg, Regina, and in Ottawa. And he deserves all the thanks for it. For those of you who don't know Dini very well, he is a former professor at the University of Ottawa for 23 years, and he has uh, been always standing up for the right causes in, and for justice, whether it's in Palestine or Syria or anywhere else. And thank you for, uh, for, for doing that. Munir is going to be thanking you on behalf of the community and giving uh, you some piece of flour for that. Thank you, Munir, for your work too. Je vous remercie beaucoup et au nom de plusieurs Syriens qui sont dans la région Ottawa Gatineau, on tient à remercier Vanessa pour son témoignage. Puis je vous donne les fleurs blanches, les blancs, c'est le symbole de la vérité, c'est le symbole de la paix. On espère la paix pour la Syrie et la vérité. Puis merci beaucoup pour votre témoignage. And last but not least, we want to thank Vanessa. <laughs> Vanessa Billy, uh, I considered myself to be very informed, and today I have learned a lot. Uh, you gave us a lot of um, weapons to deconstruct that narrative that have uh, been a very wrong narrative about, uh, about Syria. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Stephen and, uh, and Denis and myself as academics, we know that very well. Your work has been very systemic, systematic rather than systemic. It was comprehensive, it was detailed, and uh, for this, we are forever thankful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for